Yeah, please start. We can start now. Okay. Thank you, Akash. A very good afternoon. It is indeed a matter of privilege to address you all. At the outset, a very warm welcome on behalf of Principal Dothan College, Department of Botany, and Internal Quality Assurance Sales, ICWC, to today's presentation titled Human Element Basic Research and Clinical Implications. Five months back, this program would have been a seminar instead of a webinar, but in less than five months, this pandemic COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus, which has spread from a small city, Wuhan, China, to more than two crore people in almost every country in the world, and change every bit of our normal life as we were family with to neo normal and had a great impact on the healthcare, economic, in all continents across the globe. It has also initiated radical changes of common habits and lifestyles and practically changed our perception towards life. The pandemic COVID-19 is rising at an unprecedented rate. Lockdown, social distancing, masks, work from home become new normal. Initially, we did not know how to react in such a situation. A lot of us were doing our professionally measures by our prevented things. Gradually, almost every day, new information started to come out about this highly contagious virus. Researchers worldwide are putting in a high effort to enhance our understanding about the nature of the virus, to counter the spread of the virus, and to design effective vaccines and drugs. We are also become more at ease with the new normal. Department of Botany, Basin College continuously exploring academic and before on contemporary issues. Last month, we had a webinar on cyclone Ampon's impact life of children. Today, we are fortunate that we have two experts speaker with us. Uh, the, our first speaker who, who, will, who will share their valuable understanding of the COVID-19 outbreak. Dr. Anirban Ghor, microbiologist, is our first speaker, who will talk about lessons from SARS-CoV-2 adapting life after pandemic. Our second speaker, Anunna Mukherjee, will share her in-depth knowledge on 3D illustration of protein for basic drug designing, which will be an exciting practical demonstration session. In this context, I'd like to mention our second speaker is our beloved ex-student of 2014 back. Before I proceed, I'd like to ask our head of the department botany to officially inaugurate today's session. Over to sir. <coughs> Hello, everybody. Postgraduate Department of Botany, Bethune College, in collaboration with IQAC, has organized the international webinar on human ailment, basic research, and clinical implications. A few days back, Bethune College organized the first international webinar. Our principal, Madam Professor Krishna Roy, took the initiative to organize that international program. Department of Botany, in that respect, this one is the second international webinar. Each and every year, our department organize seminar, workshop on a regular basis. But this year, because of the pandemic and lockdown, we are unable to organize this program in our college. So this time it is in the form of webinar. Organizing seminar on regular basis helps our students, especially the postgraduate students, to think about their future plan of research. 
so here the most beneficiaries are our students today we have two speakers the first one is dr onirban bor he is an assistant professor in botany at ramkrishna mission vivekananda centenary college currently dr bor is pursuing his research work in the agriculture department of helsinki university finland he will deliver his lecture from finland he will cover different aspects of covid post pandemic aspect etc etc today second speaker is ananna mukherjee she did her bsc and msc both from the department of botany bethun college she is now working in an institute at university of north carolina usa she will also deliver her lecture from usa we feel proud of ananna mukherjee we are anxiously waiting for listening her lecture she will illuminating her lectures mainly on the drug design both the speakers will cover and will emphasize their lectures on the basic research i hope all the participants will enjoy their lectures and definitely will open some important avenues that will attract the present generation of the student for performing research work in future with this few words i welcome both dr anirban bor and ananna mukherjee for delivering their webinar lectures sure. thank you thank you sir for your inspiring words thank you now i am pleased to introduce to this speaker dr anirban bor dr bor presently working as an assistant professor in botany at ramakrishna mission vivekananda centenary college rahora after completing his phd 2017 on understanding plant pathogen interaction at molecular level from both institutes he moved to norway for his post doctoral research work he is awarded visiting scientist award by academy of finland on the academia where he is working as a visiting professor at the university of helsinki due to this pandemic he has returned to india and continue his work from here dr four has published a number of papers and book chapters in internationally recognized reputed journals publishing house and presented a number of posters in national international conferences my heart is to welcome to dr anirban bhar to our webinar we had love to hear from you sir before i hand over the microphone once again a gentle reminder to the participants kindly keep your microphone in mute mode and camera in switched off mode throughout the session for an uninterrupted streaming please don't type your things in the chat box we will open our chat box after a short while please type your question when it is available your question shall be answered by the speaker at the end of the session once again a very warm welcome to all of you over to dr anirban hall dr hall please Dr. Bhar, please unmute. I mean, your microphone is muted. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and a very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, uh, and I want to express my uh, gratitude to all of you, and particularly all the members of the organizing committee, for giving me the opportunity to interact with all of you. Uh, and organizing this uh, very contemporary uh, topic the uh, uh, international webinar on human health and basic research and clinical implications today i want to talk on the topic of lessons from sars cov2 or cov2 spread and process cov2 adapting life after pandemic and uh, 
during the last uh, few months we all uh, know at least we are at least we know something about this virus and uh, something about this disease as sars means the severe acute, acute respiratory syndrome and cov is a uh, corona virus and two as is, it, it is the second mutated form of the uh, previously sars cov1 and the covid 19 is the name of the disease as a corona viral disease and it's originated in the december 2019 first originated in china that's why this covid 19 so this is the uh, basic uh, basics of this uh, disease and uh, virus now okay now as uh, as uh, the the primary target audience of this uh, seminar is the students, mostly the uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students. So I have made the slides uh, as lucid as possible and uh, without compromising the without compromising the, the information. So can I uh, next slide? So. First, uh, what are the viruses? So we all know that the viruses are the most ancient life forms having the simplest genetic material, either DNA or RNA, which is protected by a surrounding proteinaceous coat, which is called the capsid. And in some cases, the structure is further uh, surrounded by a lipidus envelope. And that's why, because of the presence of this lipidus envelope, the alcohol-based hand sanitizers are very much effective against these viruses. And all the viral particles have the typical symmetry, like helical icosahedral complex or complex uh, symmetry. And the viruses have a wide range of uh, host, starting from the bacteria, fungi, plants, other animals, and the human beings. And the sizes of these viruses vary quite widely. Uh, for example, the smallest known virus till now is a parvovirus, which have 20 nanometer in diameter, whereas the variola, variola virus has a very large structure with 360 nanometer in size. And we all know that a few years back, there was a pandemic or, or epidemic of the Ebola virus. Uh, it was also a very large virus having a threat-like structure. And uh, the coronavirus, which, are, which we are now going to discuss is about them is a meat-sized virus around the average size of this virus is 120 nanometer. So next slide, please. So now uh, the size of the different viruses are compared to the bacteria and the human red blood cell. If we, if we compare the viral, uh, the structure, the size of the coronavirus with the normal E. coli bacterial cell or a human red blood cell, you can see even if the size of the virus is we, 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 we told it is a mid, middle size or somewhat towards the larger in uh, structure, but it's still very much smaller than that of the uh, human red blood cell, which have around 10,000 nanometer in diameter and average volume of 100 micrometers. So th there are many viral particles can fit into the human red blood cell. And now we can uh, imagine that within the alveolar mic macrophage has an average volume of 5,000 micrometers square cube, how much number of the viral particles can fit inside the alveolar mic macrophage. So next slide. So, so the question arises, how, how the smallest uh, viral particles, the smallest ancient viral particles can take over the most advanced eukaryotic cells? How can they uh, control over this highly advanced eukaryotic cell? And the answer is, the size doesn't matter. What matters is the number. And we all see that the number of uh, uh, idle particles that can accommodate inside the animal cell is large. And the simplest known organism has a higher class size or ha higher rate of the replication. They can produce a higher number of the organism even uh, after each replication cycle or each uh, reproduction cycle. So for the Coronavirus disease, around 1,000 viral particles are enough to get infection from a potential source, and it took only 10 minutes to get inside your body.
so i'm coming into this topic later now next slide please so now the brief uh, uh, introduction to the family background of this virus there are four uh, major groups of the coronaviruses they are the alpha beta delta and gamma coronaviruses and the delta and gamma coronavirus are mostly the avian li lineage whereas the alpha and beta are the bats and rodents uh, of lineage and uh, most of the human coronavirus next slide most of the human coronaviruses are originated from this alpha and beta coronavirus next slide yes. uh, till till now there are seven uh, human coronavirus or hcov have been detected and out of which the hcov oc43 hcov229 e and hcov nn63 these these three the previous one Uh, these three are the alpha coronaviral origin, whereas the uh, beta coronaviral origin are mostly the dangerous viral diseases, causes the dangerous viral diseases like uh, SARS-CoV, the present day SARS-CoV-2, and the MERS-CoV, all are originated from the beta lineage, that is uh, the lineage that originated from the bats. Now, I want to focus on another, another point is that there are another group of coronavirus that are emerging very soon that is the delta coronavirus or uh, delta coronavirus species and th these coronaviruses are mostly the avian coronaviruses but they are emerging so quickly so this this particular group should be uh, our future concern that probably there should be some uh, zoonotic transfer of these avian groups of coronavirus to the human beings there's a potential threat for the Uh, future coronavirus outbreaks. Now, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, the, how these uh, coronaviruses are the previous one. Uh, now, how this coronavirus Uh, look like it's it's like a round shape elliptic or pleomorphic in shape. It has a diameter of 60 to 140 nanometer, and we all know it's a positive standard RNA virus. And in the electron microscopy, uh, this looks like a crown, and that's where the name Corona came from. And the diameters of the average diameter, as I say, that 125 nanometer. And it's very sensitive to UV light and high temperature above 60 degrees Celsius, but it can survive the zero degrees Celsius chill. And the lipid solvents can effectively degrade uh, the virus to get up to 75% alcohol. Any chlorine-containing solution like hypochlor sodium hypochlorite, peroxyacetic acid, and uh, chloroform, etc., can also kill the uh, viral particles. And recently, it has been shown that the chlorohexidine, the very important components in Present in most of the mouthwashes are also can retard the viral growth. So, uh, so people can use this chlorohexidine containing mouthwashes to somehow retard the viral growth inside the mouth. So, next slide. So now the how this virus. Enters inside the cell and take control over them. First, the viral particle comes in contact uh, with a receptor molecule present in the host cell, and then it releases its it releases its genetic material inside the uh, host cell. Then it utilizes the translation machinery to produce the replication uh, machinery, and this replication machinery helps to reproduce or replicate huge number of the uh, genomic material and those are packed into a new viral particles and during this process the host immune response constant selection pressure and also the external stimuli can cause the external stimuli can cause the mutation and this mutation is reflected into generation of the new strains and new uh, viral uh, species that can be originated from the human to human transition and those 
uh, variants may be some may be more virulent or maybe less virulent. And when these viral particles are, uh, comes out from the cell, it causes the necrotic cell mass, and that is the uh, source of the secondary infection. And the secondary infection actually causes the uh, the pneumotic sy symptoms uh, inside the lung alveolar structure. Next. So, uh, if we look into the receptors of the coronaviruses, there are several receptors unknown, but the most prominent one is the APN, the amino peptide is N. These are the, this is the uh, target or receptor for most of the coronaviruses, but uh, for the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, the receptor is ACE2, this angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So, next. So if we uh, look into the structure of the SARS-CoV uh, virus, we can see there are four major uh, structural units of this virus, the spike protein, nucleocapsid, membrane, and the envelope, and which is uh, covering the genetic material that is the RNA in this case. So this spike protein is very much important. We all know now the spike protein is very much important because the spike protein actually take part in the uh, interaction phenomenon with the ACE2. So if this spike protein interacts with the ACE2 or the human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, and this uh, interaction is very much necessary to internalize the virus inside the host cell. So this uh, spike protein is very much important. And if we look into detailed structure, the genomic organization, it tells many things about this coronavirus uh, species. Uh, the next slide, please. So the genome organization, the genome organization tells that uh, there are four major structural proteins, the spike, spike for S, membrane M, envelope E, and the nucleocapsid N. And these four structural proteins actually entails how these viral particles behave with the natural selection. So if we look into the uh, structure, the rep one a and rep one b these two are, uh, are the proteins for the responsible for the replication. And the rest part, that's the, the part which is uh, marked with the red, light red, and the green color combination. So this, this region is the structural uh, region. And if we enlarge the structural region uh, in different coronavirus species, like alpha, beta, and gamma coronavirus species, we can see the variation in the beta coronavirus species in this structural region is huge. And if you look into further detail, you can see that SARS-CoV, the structural region of the SARS-CoV is further great. The further huge variation is present in the SARS-CoV among the other beta coronavirus. So what does that mean? The more, more variations in this uh, structural region means these viral species can withstand more stress or they can uh, they can fit the more mutations in, in, this, in this region or they can produce more variants. So that's why this coronavirus species, this SARS, the SARS-CoV, this coronavirus species are more uh, dangerous than that of the other uh, groups because they have, they can uh, accommodate more variations in their structural region. But interestingly, the S region or the spike protein region is very much uh, conserved. This portion is very much conserved. Why? That this portion is actually needed for the interaction with the host cell. This portion is very much essential for the virus. And is this portion is also very much essential for our dark, drug target or the uh, vaccine generation. Because this portion doesn't vary that much in case of the virus species. But the other supporting regions, the envelope, membrane, and uh, the nucleocapsid portion can cause the several mutation. And that uh, also have some uh, implication on the structural implication of the spike protein also. I'll come into detail later. Next slide, please. So, so important thing is that the spike protein is very much important. Now, if I look into the how 
all these uh, different proteins, the nucleic acid spike and uh, all these uh, inhaler proteins are uh, the abundance of this protein. How, they, how, how much the protein amounts are present in the, in the single viral species? We can see the most abundant protein in the viral coronavirus species is membrane protein that uh, around 2000 copies present in each variant. Uh, the next is the nucleic acid, around 1,000 copies are present. And the spike protein is around 100 spike proteins are present per variant, which have a 10 nanometer in uh, length and is, uh, is composed of around 300 uh, monomers. So you can uh, imagine, just imagine the protein, a, a 10 nanometer length protein is made up of 300 monomers. So, so how different kinds of variations is possible in this smallest uh, region. And it binds with the ACP2 and with the affinity of 1.30 nanomolar. And it's primed by a TMPRSS2. TMPRSS2 is a uh, type of uh, serine protease that also present in the host. Um, I will come into detail of this uh, phenomenon or interaction later. But this is also necessary for the interaction. And as I already told that uh, variant entry takes only 10 minutes, but the eclipse period is 10 hours. So it's, 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 it's very uh, pity. And the bar size is around 10 to 3 variant. For a single replication cycle, it can produce 10 to 3 variant. So it's a huge bar size for the uh, SARS-CoV. Now, next slide, please. So this slide is the most important slide as per I concept because internalization of the SARS-CoV-2 or COV-2 entails everything, everything about its evolution to human infection, everything about it, it gives you the answers of many interesting questions. We all know that this SARS-CoV is very much contagious, highly contagious. Is even contagious than that of its previous member, that is the SARS-CoV-1. And why this virus becomes so contagious and what made this virus so contagious? The answer, the answer hidden in this internalization, internalization process. The answer hidden in this internalization process. So if you look into the past uh, picture, if you can see the AC2 interacts with the uh, spike protein and the spike protein has two regions, S1 and S2. And I already said that there is a serine protease present in the host that helps in interaction of this, uh, this interaction. And this TMPRSS or serine protease fast cleaves the junction between S1 and S2, the spike protein one and spike protein two, this junction is clipped. And then the S2 is exposed. And what is the S2? S2 is nothing but a fusion peptide. It fuses with the membrane and the fusion of with the membrane causes the genetic material or the RNA to get into inside the host cell. So this is the general phenomenon or this is the general mechanism of uh, viral entry. Now, the TMPRSS can also cleave the AC2 uh, receptor and this AC2 receptor, cleaving the AC2 receptor causes the two fragment of the AC2. The fragment, the truncated AC2 can also bind with the uh, coronavirus, but the affinity is uh, slightly slower. Now, the most important is the uh, picture C, the third picture. The first one, the first one of the third picture is the internalization process of SARS-CoV-2, and the second one is the SARS-CoV-1. So I, I come first in the SARS-CoV-1. What happens? If you look into Minutely, you can see in between S1 and S2, in case of the SARS-CoV-1, the second one, in between the S1 and S2, there is a single cleavage site. That is the arginine 667. It's written as R667. That's a single cleavage site. So this single cleavage site is recognized by the serine protease. And if it is cleaved, then the virus can get inside the cell host body. So if somehow the, the blockage of the serine protease or somehow if we block this arginine residue, then the entire in, 
internalization process will be stopped in case of SARS-CoV-1. But if you see the same structure in case of the SARS-CoV-2, you can see there are three different arginine residues where the TMPRSs can cleave. The arginine 685, arginine 683, and arginine 682. So there is a huge flexibility in the cleavage side of the TMPRSs too. So this entails how the SARS-CoV-2 is so contagious because if a single uh, cleavage site is blocked, there is other two cleavage sites open for the entry of the virus. So this causes the SARS-CoV-2 is a huge contact contagious in nature. But now the question arises, what happens in the SARS-CoV-1 that gives this uh, flexibility to the SARS-CoV-2, this uh, huge flexibility in the cleavage site? That comes in the next slide. Yes, yes. So if you if you see the genomic analysis structure of uh, different uh, SARS species from from the different origin like pairs, pangolins, SARS-CoV-1, COV-2, etc. The next slide. Yes, this one. So we can see there are several mutations or modifications in the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 that leads to the that, that leads to the generation of the huge contagiousness as well as uh, uh, like flexibility in the disease spreading. Uh, the next slide. The major three uh, notable features of these mutations are first first one is the mutations in the RBD, the receptor binding domain that is present in the S1 region of the S1 region of the SARS spike protein. The next slide, please. yes, this one. So the mutation in the RBD1, the six amino acid mutation takes place. I have mentioned the six amino acid mutation from the SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV to the SARS-CoV-2. These six mutations, in, these six uh, mutation can cause the arginine loop that I already told you, the three arginine residues uh, that are clipped by the serine proteases that I already told you. This arginine loop is produced because of these six mutations in the arbitrary region. And also a polybasic purine cleavage, cleavage site in between S1 and S2 because of the addition of a uh, proline residue. We all know that the proline has a high, uh, you know, uh, bending capacity among all other uh, amino acids. So proline, the addition of the proline can generate this uh, arginine loop and it allows the virus to uh, have the more flexibility in getting internalization. And hard one is another, uh, is a huge uh, implication in SARS-CoV-2 modification is the addition of a O-linked glycans in serine 673 678 and serine 686. In three regions, there are uh, only glycans are added. You can see in the picture, the uh, blue and the red, this structure is the normal coronavirus structure. But the addition of a only glycan, that is the eolus, eolus structure like the umbrella, it, it forms a mucin-like domain. And this mucin-like domain is causes, it produces a shield, a shield around the entire virus. And the shielding of the virus, what, what does it mean? The shielding of the virus is actually helps the virus to evade the immune system because the epitope is not exposed directly to the immune system because of the presence of this O-link glycans. So these are the major mod modifications in the SARS-CoV-2 that allows the virus to be more contagious and more uh, stable in our immune system. And this is the major challenge in the generation of the antiviral drugs as well as the vaccines. So the next slide. So next slide, it, it is uh, the function of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. We all are talking about ACE2, but what does this ACE2 actually does in, in the body? Next slide, please. 
I cannot see the box. Yes, this one. So, uh, what is the function of the AC2 in the human body? The, the AC2 receptor is mostly found in our, our nasopharyngeal cavity, also in the, our lungs, livers, uh, hearts, also in some brains, in, in, in the brains, and also the like endothelial membranes of our blood vessels and all that. But what does the, this angiotensin and converting enzyme do actually does in the human beings, normal human beings? As the name implies, it converts the angiotensin 1 to the angiotensin 2. And this angiotensin is nothing but a polypeptide hormone that are uh, receptored by the ACE2 type 1 receptor or normal ACE2 receptor. And that helps in the blood pressure control, in the normal alveolar uh, inflammation control, and the lung injury. These are the normal functions for the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme and angi angiotensin in the body. So they control the uh, blood pressure, the vasoconstriction, uh, normal renal function. These are the normal functions of, of the angiotensin enzyme. And it has been reported uh, and evidenced that the people with the smoking behavior have the high concentration, high level of ACE2 receptor because smoking induces the overexpression of the ACE2. So smoking causes the more vulnerability to, towards the coronavirus disease because there are more uh, receptors in your body then you can get uh, easily infected by the virus species. So if you are a smoker, it's a, it's a good time to uh, quit smoking because smoking can make you more vulnerable to the uh, disease because of the high concentration of the ACE2. Next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, th this slide tells the uh, like different symptoms in the uh, different symptoms due to the coronavirus viral disease. I cannot see the uh, slide. Oh. Next slide in my screen. Can you see it uh, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is okay. 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 So uh, it, we all know. We all, we all know now the basic symptoms and all this. I, I, I'm not going into detail of this. But one thing is that the 80% of the cases, we see that the most of the 80% of the cases are either asymptomatic or they have produced the mild symptoms. But only 14% cases are, need some interventions like um, oxygen requirement. And among them, the 5% needs the critical care and 2%, around 2% is the mortality rate. So what is the reason behind this huge variation of this uh, dreaded virus? There's a huge variation in the population. The answer lies within our genetic makeup. A very interesting uh, publication came in the New England Journal of Medicine in last month, last two months ago, where they started the genome-wide association or GWAS with the severe COVID-19 patients with the respiratory failure revealed that the single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP is associated with the high risk individual. And what are those SNPs? They're located mostly in two, two chromosomes in the human body. The first locus is present in the chromosome number three. The locus is 3P21.31. This, this associated with the six single span genes. The name of the genes are SLC6A20, LZTFL1, CCR9501, CXCR6, and XCR1. All these genes are normally related with the chemokine synthesis. Some are, some are associated with the autoimmune diseases. And these are the six SNPs, which are essential for the high risk individual. They are associated with the high risk individual. Uh, of the coronavirus disease. So that means if these SNPs are present within the, within the genetic makeup of an individual, they are the high risk, uh, they have the high risk towards the coronavirus disease. And, and second one is the most important, the chromosome number nine, the locus is 3Q34.2, which is associated with the AD, which is associated with, I 
which is associated with the red uh, abo blood group and it says that the people it says that the people with the uh, blood group a are more vulnerable towards the coronavirus disease rather than the people with the blood group b and ab whereas the blood group o have some self protective effect towards the uh, coronavirus disease but that doesn't mean that the people with the o blood group are completely protected from the coronavirus disease that doesn't mean that but this the genetic association study says that somehow the people if you are if if you are an individual with a blood group o you are not among the high risk group of coronavirus disease but that doesn't mean that 100% cases of the uh, people with the o blood group are completely uh, uh, protected from the coronavirus that doesn't mean that but is a association study the most people having the blood group a are vulnerable but the blood group o are somehow protected so that, that's the in, uh, interesting finding to say uh, now next slide Can you see? No. Uh, no, I cannot see. Yeah, now it's visible. Uh, this slide tells the how to detect the SARS uh, COV2 in laboratory. There are uh, several uh, measurements, but uh, the three are the most uh, promising and most popular the elisa kit based the crispr kit based and the rtpcr based and we all know this uh, somehow uh, during the uh, like so much of uh, uh, you know circulation of uh, the news but uh, the elisa kit is not uh, uh, till now is not uh, approved by the fda and uh, also the crispr sorry the crispr is not approved by the fda but elisa has recently been approved by the fda which is called the rapid antigen test which is now going on so widely and most uh, acceptable form of the uh, coronavirus disease detection is the rt pcr based detection uh, can i go in next slide Next slide tells you that uh, the adapting life that is uh, important, I think, in this present situation. I cannot see the slide. It takes some time. I think, I think it is taking time. Uh, is it visible? No, till now. Okay, I can, I can, yeah, now it's good. Uh, we all know that the adapt, okay. adapting life, if we start with adapt, this adapting life, we know that the spread of the disease is uh, mostly the human to human. So physical distancing, the terminology that uh, widely circulated is very much necessary. We cannot... Uh, we cannot... Uh, over look at this because uh, this is the most important thing we can follow to stop the spread of the disease. Uh, next slide, please. And this is very much important uh, because most of us, we, we are very much uh, unaware that how this, uh, the cloud of uh, suspended particles or the aerosols are released by our mouth so during the uh, when when we talk when we sneeze or something like that. The air in bromage uh, is calculated the sneezing dynamics where he calculated that the infection is equal to viral particles into time. This is a time lapse photography, high resolution time lapse photography that gives you the idea how much cloud of the aerosols are produced by a single sneezing or a single talking. And if you uh, just draw a uh, line, you can see the last picture. There is a fountain of uh, 
uh, materials are coming out to our mouth in each time we talk each time we uh, sneeze or speak so normally a normal breathing can release 50 to 50000 droplets per exhalation can you imagine you can you can identify it if you wear a mask and a speak you can find that after you exhale the huge amount of vapor are accumulating on your specs on your glasses so that's the amount of droplets you are releasing in each exhalation and if we count the infectious particle within it it around 20 viral particles present so thank god we we still now there is no report on the covid 19 but it, this data is based on the other viral diseases the around 20 viral particles are released uh, per exhalation so and 1000 particles are required to get infected so if two people are sitting side by side one is covid positive and other is healthy so they are not talking with each other but if they spend time more than 50 minutes the healthy people will get infection because of the exhalation only the exhalation so speaking can release a 10 times more infect infectious particles around 200 particles okay per minute so if two people are just talking with one another one is positive and another is healthy so it takes only five minutes five into 200 is equal to thousand so it only takes five minutes to get infection and if sneezing happens it causes the millions of droplets. So, so that's why the wearing of mask or the face shield is so important because if a people wear a mask, it reduces the infection up to 40%. So if both the people are talking and wearing a mask, then they together reduces the phenomenon up to 80%. 40% of each is equal to 80%. So, so that's why the people are always talking about wearing masks and face shield and uh, all those things. And if we, if we are uh, talking about the many people are telling that uh, this virus is airborne or something like that. Okay, th this virus is droplet borne. And if we, if we uh, just uh, thinking of it, then the larger size droplet to settle down easily uh, on the floor and something like that. And the smaller size can produce a cloud of the uh, droplets that can easily float on the air and the floating of the air depends on so many of factors the relative humidity the pollution the, uh, the velocity of the wind there are so many uh, factors that can influence the uh, spread and the suspension of the infected particles in the air so so that depends so next slide so wearing mask properly is very much important and hand hygiene and maintaining social distancing is the only way. Now the question is which kind of mask do we wear? The European standardization according to DIN EN 149, it tells that there are three different types of masks available, FFP1, 2, and 3. The FFP1 is nothing but a pollution mask. It, uh, it can filter, filter the dust and irritants up to 80%, FFP2, is used to protect the solid and liquid aerosols up to 94% and FFP3 is a high grade um, mask which are required the health workers and professionals which can, uh, which have the exposure, occupational exposure limit up to 99.5%. So, so these are the technical terms, but what kind of mask do you wear? The next slide will tell you. The one research in one research in University of Nebraska, Ohama, uh, tells that a simple cotton mask with a three layer is enough to protect us. There are several uh, fabrics they have studied, and they saw that the uh, pure cotton material, the cotton uh, fabric, uh, in uh, like in foreign countries, they told it's a tea towel the towel material. The towel that we are talking about is not that, the, the pure cotton material. This pure cotton material in two layer format, it can give the protection up to 96.7%. Okay, and the lowest protection can, give, can be given by the material like silk. So if, if you don't have, uh, 
You don't have to wear the N95 and all this kind of mask. You just wear the simple cotton mask by increasing the fold. And that's the, uh, like uh, N95 and all other FFP3 masks are doing. The, the principle behind the generation of this, uh, the generation of this uh, mask is like those. Because if we increase the fold, they, the, the random orientation of the fabric material is there. And there's a every chance that when a uh, aerosol is uh, getting inside, there is a everything. If it increases the fold, they, there is a every chance it can fit one, any one of the uh, fabric material and get absorbed by them. So if you increase the more fold, if you, in, you increase the more protection onto you. So that is the important. Next slide. So uh, click continuously. So there are, uh, this tells you the different uh, like uh, format of wearing mask, all are incorrect. But if you should wear the mask in proper orientation, all these cartoon pictures are taken from the New York Times uh, because it, it's not us. The people around the whole world are doing these kind of things. They are not covered the entire mouth and nose and cheeks and all those things. So these are not only us. They're, there are many people like us everywhere in the world. So you, you have to wear the mask and wear it correctly. That's the important. Now the next slide. Many people are uh, asking that what is the like uh, way to get out of this disease? So there are no thing now. There is no specific drug for the COVID nineteen. But there are, I have uh, listed the nine different therapies or the drugs they have. Uh, used uh, by the uh, worldwide uh, healthcare of, uh, officials or healthcare uh, professionals. Like Remdesivir is an important antiviral drug, the inhibitor of the RNA dependent RNA polymer is used. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, you all know. The chloroquine and hydrochloroquine that causes the gly glycosylation of the ECE2, alkalization of the cell cytosol, and it causes the better antigen presentation. Some people in the China use the chemostat misyler, the serine protease inhibitor. Tocilizumab is a humanized antibody to control the cytokine storm. And six is the lopinavir ritonavir combination along with the IFN beta, the interferon beta is a, uh, is a drug combination used for the HIV, but uh, this drug has not proven to be very much effective against this coronavirus. The nitoxamine, <coughs> the nitox, <coughs> sorry. Nitro, so oxanide is a, another uh, drug that uh, is not been tested widely. Dexamethasone is presently under scanning under the recovery project, the randomized evolution of the COVID-19 therapy. And nine, the most widely used is the convalescent plasma therapy, that is a neutralizing antibody or uh, neutralizing antibody that are, they, they, those are, uh, uh, treated from the COVID-19 uh, patients or survivors. So these are the major drugs that are administered against the COVID-19 disease. And next slide, please. And the most uh, awaited question is the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And when does this uh, vaccines come? There are major uh, platforms for the vaccine generation and uh, some of the, some are the RNA vaccines, DNA vaccine, recombinant protein vaccine, viral vector-based vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, or inactivated vaccines. In case of the live attenuated and inactivated vaccine, they uses the whole whole virion particles, whereas the other like RNA, DNA, recombinant protein vaccine, and the uh, viral vector-based vaccine. In this uh, case of vaccines, uh, the people are using only the S protein, the spike protein. That I told that this protein. Is a primary target because of them, uh, because of their conserved nature. So, so in the next slide, I have just uh, in the next slide, this I have just uh, listed some popular vaccines that are entered into phase one, two, or phase three trials. 
So I have made the title of the I have made the title of this uh, slide is COVID nineteen the race for a vaccine. It's a very a very interesting review came in twenty twenty by Emily Locke in the Journal of Reading Angiotensin and Androsterone. So you, you can read it. It's a very interesting one. So it's so interesting that I have made the title of this slide. So there is a huge uh, uh, race of production of this vaccine. Around 158, and uh, presently it's around 165, I think, there are vaccine candidates. But out of which only 135 has uh, preclinical or exploratory stage of development, and very few have the potential. I have listed some of them, and most of them are very popular. You all know the name of these uh, vaccines, like Moderna mRNA-1273, CanSino Biologicals 85 NCOV, INO, INC's INO 4800, Syngen Geno, Immune Medical Institute, LV, SMANP, DC, pathogen specific efficient, Oxford, AstraZeneca, CH, AUX1, or the commercial name of OVCH. You all know that uh, Oxford, uh, University of Oxford, and with the collaboration of the AstraZeneca, they have produced a CH, AUX1 vaccine, which is presently under trial in India in its phase two and phase three. And around 17 hospitals are uh, recognized for their first trial. And all these hospitals are mostly from the Maharashtra, uh, the Pune, Jalandhar, and all this region. Uh, no hospitals from the West Bengal I have noticed because most of the hospitals are from the, uh, like Maharashtra, Jalandhar, um, Rajasthan, and all this region. And around 1,600 uh, participants or volunteers and have chosen for this COVID shield. The official name of this is CHADUX. And what is the nature of this vaccine? At the same time, the Moderna mRNA-1273 is, has, started its, has started its trial in the USA. So what are the uh, like uh, basic basics of this uh, vaccine, generation of this vaccine? Actually, CH ADUX vaccine is a simpanji adenoviral vector. They use the simpanji adenoviral vector and which expresses the spike protein. What does that mean? Actually, the, the generation of the vaccine is not so uh, easy because uh, there are several steps and there are several uh, side effects of the uh, vaccines. And some of the vaccines can produce the side effects even after two years of the uh, administration. So can you imagine if, if you administer a uh, vaccine, so you can see the uh, side effects even after the two years, there's a provision in the, the generation of the vaccine. So it's, it's, that's why it took some time. But in case of the Oxford vaccine, the ch this this vector, this adenoviral vector has already administered the human being for the long, long back. So we, we know the vector backbone and this vector backbone doesn't have any prominent uh, immunogenic effect in the human beings. Only the difference is it expresses the spike protein. So this vaccine uh, for me is, is at the number one some, somehow because they have the less risk to produce because we all know this vector, the uh, adenoviral vector for long back. And if the Moderna mRNA-1273 has uh, get the uh, permission to human administration, then it should be the uh, probably the first mRNA vaccine to be commercially utilized because the previous there is no uh, mRNA vaccine. There are several mRNA vaccines produced, but they not, none of them have get the permission to uh, commercial production. I don't know, but uh, probably this is the uh, this is true that if the modern get the permission, it is the first mRNA vaccine uh, will get the permission. So mRNA vaccine has several uh, um, side effects, a huge uh, major side effect. That's why the people are hesitated with this uh, uh, permission. So now another two, we all know that India also enters in phase one two trial by the production of the, their co-vaccin from the Bharat Biotech. And the same vaccine is produced also by the Zydus Cadilla in the name of Zykov D. The same vaccine are same, but the name, the trade name are different. And now, uh, Russia's Sputnik V, uh, there is no report I have seen uh, regarding the, uh, this Sputnik V uh, 
vaccine. Only one report is the Gamalia Institute of Trial that includes 38 people in a, a military base camp. So this is uh, this pro it like it, it looked like it only passes the trial one phase one trial. I don't know. There is no report, and you cannot see. Uh, you can see the uh, trials report of any vaccine from the uh, clinical trials dot gov dot usa. Uh, there are every reports are uh, present there, so you can check the uh, trial data set from there for each vaccine. So hope for the best. We will get some of the vaccine recent soon. So the last slide is. Please don't be a COVID and habituate in the new normal. We all know the our uh, what we have to do. We all know that self hygiene is the most important. Washing hands, uh, follow distancing, wearing masks is important. But still, we are doing some mistake. So this is our responsibility at this point of time to protect ourselves, to responsible, to behave like a responsible citizen. Respect other COVID frontliners and care your fellow citizens and stop spreading rumors. At the same time, don't take any situation lightly and help the man mankind to fight back its biggest challenge in the recent past. So, this is all our responsibility. Next slide. So, thank you very much for your patience and uh, definitely wearing masks. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Anishman Bhar. Uh, sir, we are enriched from your enlightening discourse. And we have learned a lot, uh, many, from your lecture. Starting from the uh, structure, genetical organization of the virus, and uh, up to the how to adapt with this new normal, including mask, is so important. We should behave like an uh, uh, responsible citizen by wearing, not infecting others. And the most importantly, about the mutations of the virus, and which will uh, raise another uh, deadly strain of, uh, in the form of the avian flu. This is all we have learned. I am I'm definitely sure that. Your talk is uh, very much uh, enriching our students. Uh, so please, now the session is open for the question answering over to Sita. Sita, thank you, uh, Dr. Lama. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll be just uh, asking the questions uh, which have been uh, posted uh, both on the YouTube live channel and uh, the uh, Zoom chat box. So the first question is from Onik Takaji. He asks that uh, how stimuli of human cell cause mutation in the viral particle? Okay. The stimuli uh, means that uh, we, we all have the uh, immune response in, uh, in our body. So the stimuli doesn't mean any external stimulus or something like that. The stimuli here, I, I, I want to uh, just tell that the, each, each human being has different immunogenic response. Some have the strong immunogenic response uh, than the others. So the same virus can behave differently, can have the different uh, environment when get inside the different human beings. So it, it get different uh, uh, constraint or different restriction from our immunogenic cell in different host cells. So th that's the uh, selection pressure for the virus also. They cannot behave equally in each of the uh, human beings because the genetic makeup and the immunogenic makeup is different in each individual. So, and th this is the reason I'm telling that these immunogenic stimuli can save the mutation of the virus. They, they have changed their uh, some portion to become more uh, efficient. 
in the next round of interviews. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, the next question uh, is uh, what uh, is angiotensin? Okay, Ang angiotensin is a uh, peptide hormone and is responsible for the vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction means uh, the, the constriction of the uh, blood vessels. And it releases uh, the aldosterone, an important hormone that, uh, that normally controls uh, the uh, uptake of the sodium ion from the uh, renal system. It's released from the adrenal cortex and which helps, the, uh, helps our important uh, inorganic material present our blood bloodstream to remain inside our bloodstream and the water and all other excretory material to leach out from the uh, renal system. So this is basically a uh, peptide hormone. The third question is from uh, Shondi Pramani, who is asking that why elderly people and uh, people with medical conditions are more vulnerable to this illness. Okay, so uh, th there are several reasons of this. Uh, I'm coming one by one. First is that uh, elderly people don't have the immunogenic a strong immunity as uh, as like the uh, young individuals. They have already some compromised immune system. So that is the first reason to uh, getting infection more easily. And uh, second is the the comorbid patients, so like people with the other uh, med uh, medical uh, situations. In, in those cases also, if somebody has uh, already have some infection or somebody ha already has some disease, their immune system is already compromised. And that's why the, our immune system cannot fight back to the new infection. That is the reason why um, uh, this uh, kind of people, this group of people are uh, more uh, vulnerable to the uh, Okay, uh, and uh, the next uh, question is from the same person that why people with uh, blood group A are more vulnerable to the disease? Okay, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but uh, if you ask me why, I, I cannot say anything about it because there is no report. Uh, in, in last two months ago, one uh, publication came that I already told you in New England Journal of uh, Medicine, where they started a huge number of the patients, COVID-19 patients, uh, who have the high uh, risk uh, zone or who, who produce the uh, critical phenomena, the critical symptoms. And when they started all these people, their genetic uh, structures are or genetic materials or genetic informations are studied, which is called the genome-wide association analysis. The association means uh, the association of the disease with the different genes or different condition of the genes. Uh, that is called the genome-wide association study or genome-wide association analysis. And this genome-wide association study uh, revealed that the people with the blood group A are more vulnerable, the, the people uh, with the blood group A are more at the risk of the coronavirus disease in a more critical condition. But if you ask me why, the answer uh, I cannot give you because that study is still going on. Okay, and uh, so- They have uh, only yeah. uh, published uh, data that- That the observation has been published, but the reason is uh, not yet known to us. Okay, uh, and uh, we are basically interested in uh, immunity. So there are many questions regarding immunity. One has been asked by uh, Dr. Konna Shengupta. Uh, she is just asking you to uh, highlight the facts that how immunity against the coronavirus can be uh, boosted. Now her question is specifically uh, to raise awareness among people who don't know uh, still now because uh, already a lot of discussion is going on in this regard. But uh, still, uh, it would be nice if you uh, like uh, enhance our knowledge a bit more in this uh, field, actually, regarding the immunity against the coronavirus. So it's a, well, it's a uh, very uh, general uh, 
uh, answer I can give because there is no uh, such immunity specific to the coronavirus. There's a immunity generalized against any viral diseases, any uh, pathogens. So our immune system has two different uh, like uh, uh, components, the humoral and the adaptive. So humoral uh, system, which, which, which means that we, we, when acquired immunity and adaptive immunity, when some people are uh, getting some infection, our immune system produces some uh, antibody against them. So if a new pathogen comes in contact with a person, so there is a every possibility that the generation of the antibody happens and this antibody completely neutralizes the pathogen or maybe their antibody cannot withstand the disease and the disease are happening. But there are some other immune cells also present in our bloodstream. Very important among them is a C T cell cytotoxin. It's a cytotoxic T cell. These T cells are uh, like uh, what I say, these T cells are like bullets. When it find any uh, foreign particles in your bloodstream, in your body, they, irrespective of uh, like uh, what kind of pathogen they are, they just kill it. So our responsibility presently is now is to boost up our general immune system. So how can we boost our general immune system? The, the, the reasons are very much, uh, you know, uh, we all know it. The first thing we have to say that don't take any stress. Any kind of stress, any kind of like hypertension or, or any kind of depression can cause the immune system to go low. So don't be upset, don't be stressed. This is the uh, psychological condition. And second, uh, like eat healthy in different uh, minerals like zinc and uh, balanced vitamins. The people are, are talking about to take balanced vitamins like vitamin B complex and uh, uh, other vitamins uh, along with the zinc to boost up your immunity. And uh, there's another uh, uh, vitamin that is vitamin C. We all know that the vitamin C is a general inducer of uh, the scavenging machinery, high scavenging machinery present in, in our uh, vitamin C. So any kind of stress or any kind of uh, infection can cause the oxidative stress or oxidative burst in our body. And this oxidative burst not only uh, slow down your immune response, but also it kills your own cell. So if you take vitamin C regularly, so it can help you to rejuvenate your uh, inner cells, rejuvenate your immune cells that in turn help you to uh, fight back the any kind of disease and another thing I, I want to focus in this regard is that uh, drinking a lot of water can help you to prevent infection if you ask me why because you know that the target cell the same in the target condition are less vulnerable to any kind of infection so if if uh, any kind of uh, dehydration takes place, that dehydrated cell is more vulnerable to any infection. So if you take regularly a lot of water, your entire body is hydrated and this hydrated cell will help you to prevent the infection quite uh, widely. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, keeping in uh, tone with the immunity, the next question is by Anthara Banerjee that uh, how does uh, herd immunity develop and uh, she also uh, has a question uh, regarding the uh, medicine. And uh, so uh, she is asking that uh, what are the doses of the medicine that are uh, fixed uh, in the recovery uh, trial and also in normal cases? Like she has a specific question regarding the how the doses of the medicine is fixed. And her second question is what is the herd immunity? Uh, do doses of uh, what I cannot understand. Doses uh, of vaccine. Or... No, the dose of the medications, like uh, the medicines which you mentioned, which are uh, being used actually. So, how is the doses standardized for the okay. medicines okay. which okay. are used? 
Okay. So, so, uh, so I, I'm coming in the past question that is hard immunity is, is a very common terminology now. Actually, hard immunity as uh, it, it cannot uh, form so quickly, so easily. So I can give you one example is that um, you all know that the, in case of the Spanish flu, uh, the flu sustained for the two years. And one interesting uh, information is that the, the most important molecule that is responsible for the uh, pathogenicity of the Spanish flu is uh, came highlighted in 1994 in, in, in early 90s and the disease was uh, like manifested in 1920 so it, it gives it 70 it took 70 years to find out the uh, actual cause of the severity of the disease so uh, science is always trying to uh, develop a time to sort out but it, it took its own time so in, in question of the hard immunity, hard immunity, uh, the theoretical hard immunity means that when a population, among the population, around 80% of the population are uh, getting the antibody against a epidemic disease, you can say that uh, that population is uh, heading towards hard, hard immunity. So, but this hard immunity, that means that 80, at least 80% of the population have to exposed towards the disease so if you if i i'm telling you that if you consider the population of the india then then you, you can imagine the 80 percent of the indian population means how much number of the population is has to exposed uh, towards the disease so hard immunity is something uh, that that uh, that is uh, more theoretical at, at, at this point of time and uh, the, if, if we, if we uh, look into the spread of the disease, the space, the spreading of the disease is taking place. In recent future, only a vaccination procedure can uh, stop the spread of the disease because uh, hard immunity is, is long drawn. We, we, we cannot uh, expect the hard immunity in the recent future because uh, then we have to expose our 80% of the population, at least 80% of the population towards the uh, pathogen. And then only they will get some amount of, uh, you know, uh, antibody against that virus. But another, uh, uh, there is another phenomenon that it, it also, that a natural eradication of the disease uh, due to the huge uh, selection pressure is also operating on the virus. So virus is uh, continuously mutated. They are continuously getting mutation. So, so many mutation can cause the uh, reduction of the pathogenicity. So there, there may be a reason that uh, the virus may exist in the system, but they cannot produce that much of symptoms or that much, that much of severity. So hard immunity in that terms may arise soon, but we, we don't know. We don't know how nature will react. This is a dynamic phenomenon. So if the normal, if you ask me the normal hard immunity, it's long, long to go. But if you say the, if, in the process of the natural selection, the virus will, will lose its pathogenicity, the severity of the pathogenicity, then it may, it may possible to generate the hard immunity zone. And uh, the second question is the doses. Uh, there are like in different, uh, for the different drugs, the doses are uh, different, but I can see, I can say you that uh, if you, if you, uh, read in detail among these drugs, you can you can uh, clearly find out that most of the most of these drugs are not um, specific for the COVID nineteen. They they are uh, for they are meant for the other diseases. As for example, the dexamethasone is a, is now uh, very much used in case of the terminally ill COVID patient. So around six milligram of this dexamethasone have found to be effective. But in which group, this 6 mg of dexamethasone is effective, effective in case of the critically ill and the people and the patients with the oxygen requirement. These two groups are 
uh, responded well. But the people with the normal uh, mild symptoms, they are not uh, recovered by the by this dexamethasone. They are only supportive therapy uh, has done for those group of people, and they are responded to them. So all these medicine are uh, administered in case of the terminally ill patient. Not these are not the medicine for the COVID nineteen. So please don't uh, think that if people are getting infection, that they should sort of buy one of these medicine and uh, take it. So th that is not possible because these are not the COVID nineteen drugs. The these drugs are uh, utilizing trial and error basis for uh, by the medical professionals, and they uh, fix the uh, doses of the drug depending on the condition of the patient. So, and most of these drugs are administered towards the terminally ill patient, the patient with the oxygen required, not for the normal. Uh, thank you. And uh, like we are just running short of time, yet there are too many questions to answer. And uh, then uh, next, just the two questions. Uh, uh, actually, it's the similar question by uh, Srijita Paul and Obishek Mukherjee. They want to know that uh, what is the chance of uh, a second infection taking place? Why does people get infected second time? And yes. also uh, a similar question by Chandri Dey, who wants to know that what are the associated permanent damages associated uh, with this disease? So uh, once a person is uh, contracting the disease, what is the chance of permanent, some any sort of permanent damage? And secondly, can this, uh, the disease relapse back again? So uh, the first question is very much interesting. And we, uh, in many cases, we see that uh, uh, the people are getting recovered or again uh, gets the infection. So uh, there are uh, two reasons for this. First reason is the coronavirus has several uh, strains. Uh, for example, the strain that originated in Wuhan uh, has recognized as zero strain. And from this zero, there are many like H1, H12A, H12, uh, HB2, et cetera, et cetera. There are several strains that originated and uh, they're specific for the different geographical region. The basic structure is same, but there are some mutations. So uh, these are the, better to say, these are the serotypes. So if a, if a person or individual is infected uh, with a single serotype and getting recovered, and if he or she is exposed to another serotype, there's every chance of getting infected because that serotype is not, uh, the immunity against that serotype is not present in that individual. So this is the reason why people are getting infection. The first reason is infection by different serotypes. And the second uh, reason is when a viral or you know, a bacterial disease happening, mostly the viral disease, we, we, our uh, immune system has developed some, some kind of memory. Uh, and this is called the memory T cell. This is another kind of T cell that, uh, that keeps the memory of the infection inside our body. So in, in many cases, we found that uh, uh, the memory for the coronavirus disease is last like 21 days to 140 days. So the memory period is not so big. So 120 days, uh, 140 days uh, means at around uh, like four months. So if a person, are exposed to same serotype after four to five months, there is a possibility of getting infection. Uh, and some strains, they only stays for 21 days. So in each 21 days, there is a possibility of getting infection. So and this is the answer of the first question. And the second uh, question is associated uh, uh, damages. damages. There, yes, uh, there are several associated damages are recorded. We firstly, we have to say that this disease is new. We are not experienced it earlier. So everything with the days goes off, we are experiencing some new kind of infection, new kind of symptoms, new kind of side effects. So these are all, we are all in a um, uh, learning phase. So till now, uh, uh, some kind of uh, um, side effects are like, um, permanent alveolar damage in some patients. The alveoli are getting um, damaged permanently. So, so people are uh, 
uh, having the coronavirus diseases are more prone to bronchial problems later on. This is uh, one uh, side of it. Second is some people are getting some renal dis disturbances. Some people are getting uh, a problem with the blood circulation and blood problems. And we all know that in, in case of the uh, children, the children below 10 years, they don't uh, possess uh, extreme symptoms like uh, fever or chest pain or uh, breathing problem. They, they have some mild symptoms associated with the, most of them have the mild symptoms associated with the diarrhea type of uh, phenomenon. But uh, this is a very recent report that uh, for the uh, children's, uh, the prolonged side effects uh, are there and they are affecting their nerves, particularly the brain tissues. The development of the brains are getting hampered in case of the corona infected children. So these are the common um, side effects for the coronavirus industry now, but with the time goes up, maybe we experience some more. Some other symptoms as well. Okay, uh, and uh, there is one basic yeah. question. Uh, what is the difference between uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 from the uh, viral point of view? Uh, from the viral structural point of view, actually. Okay. Uh, I have uh, actually uh, the SARS-CoV-1 or the SARS-CoV is the first virus from where the SARS-CoV-2 has originated. And uh, the basic structure is same. If you see the structure of these two virus side by side, they are same, but there, there are some modifications. I have already mentioned the modification, but yeah. uh, they, the major modification is there is, there is a six amino acid mutation yeah. in case of SARS-CoV that leads to generate the SARS-CoV-2 because this mutation causes a sorry, arginine loop that uh, helps the virus to become more flexible to getting inside the uh, human cell body. And another is the uh, uh, generation or uh, addition of a O-link glyco glycosylation site and O-link glycosylation-like structure that uh, covered up the entire viral structure. And this, this structure actually helped the COV to, to evade the immunogenic response because the epitopes are not exposed. These are the uh, difference, basic difference. Okay. And uh, coming to our last question. Another, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can continue. Sorry. Hello? Okay, that's, uh, I, I just uh, want to uh, tell you one thing. Yes. Can, can you hear? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, one thing I want to add uh, is that that uh, the spike protein is interacting with the ACE2 in, in, in case of both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, one of my uh, colleague, uh, he's working in IIT Delhi and he's uh, uh, studying uh, some interaction pattern, interaction of uh, SARS-CoV-2 with the ACE2. And a very interesting finding is that it's, it's not till published, it's now working on this, is that this, this SARS-CoV-2, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and AC2 interaction is optimal, but only 40% optimal. But this 40% optimal interaction can lead to this kind of devastation. So can you imagine if this optimization leads to 100%, how much devastation can cause so and now the question is why this 40 percent? Because the uh, in case of the SARS COV1 and ACE2 interaction is highly optimal. The optimacy of uh, these two interactions quite high. But this SARS COV1 has mutated in some portions to generate the SARS COV2, and this leads to a new strain. And this new strain is now trying to uh, like uh, modify it to thrive into the, like uh, forming the uh, highest possible optimal interaction with the ACE2. So the viral, in the viral point of view, he is also uh, trying to become more uh, capable of infection. And the, from us, from the human beings, we are also trying to modify our 
uh, immune immune system and the receptor system to uh, like uh, drive back the viral spike protein. So now the arm race is going on between this virus and us. So this is a like a ward like situation. The invisible <laughs> ward is happening in, inside our cell. And uh, so interestingly, uh, unlike the last question we can take is also based on this ACE2. So uh, actually, uh, Akash Mondal, uh, he's asking that ACE2, uh, I'm sorry, this question is from Ombika Mormon. Uh, ACE2, uh, like how do, uh, does it have any uh, role in other types of cancer, in cancer as well, especially uh, he wants to uh, know about lung cancer. The role of ACE2 in protection yes. against lung cancer. The question was asked by Ombika Bormon uh, through YouTube. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there, there are some report of this uh, ACE2 receptor in some carcinogen. Uh, because uh, in any kind of lung situation, this um, uh, I already told that ACE2 is involved in normal lung health or normal lung expansion on and uh, vasoconstriction this kind. so any kind of uh, uh, generation of the tumor or tumor like structure in the uh, lung tissue or alveolar tissue can also uh, has an effect on ac tourism okay uh, thank you sir uh, for addressing the questions uh, so lucidly like we came to know about a lot of things even through the question answer session so uh, thanks to the participants for that and uh, i would now like to uh, hand over the microphone to uh, dr shimonti ghosh uh, so thank you sir once again thank you so much smita am i audible yeah yeah you are audible okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Our next speaker for this webinar is Anunna Mukherjee from North Carolina, USA. I'm very happy that I got this opportunity to introduce Anunna to our participants. She has been our student during her UG and PG courses here at Bethun College, Kolkata. Since then, she has gone a long way. She started her career as a science writer in Jharkhand State News, but had to leave the job very soon as she joined a course in biotechnology and bioinformatics at the University of Missouri, USA. She has mentored uh, high school students in programming and genetics as a part of the US Army Research and Apprenticeship Program. And uh, from there, she was awarded a scholarship to Presently, she works as a soft, uh, research software engineer at RENSI, that is Renesta Computing Institute uh, at the U Chapel Hill. The topic of lecture is introduction to protein docking and drug design. Maybe she will providing us some insight into the uh, drug designing uh, for the novel coronavirus that has created the pandemic of today. Uh, so let's go get over to Anunna Mukherjee. Over to you, Anunna. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, SG Ma'am. Um, I am very happy to be here today. And is it okay if I start sharing my screen? It's okay, dear. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, yes, it's visible. Good afternoon. I would like to thank my teachers for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present this topic to you today. I feel very privileged and honored to be here. Since we are discussing the realm of human ailments, we have selected the topic, Introduction to Protein Docking and Drug Design, as a way of demonstrating what goes on behind the scenes in the process of drug development. As we are living through a pandemic where a deadly viral infection has become a part of our lives, I thought I would take this opportunity to talk specifically about the fundamentals of 3D elucidation of protein structure. It helps us in creating and designing drugs. 
I will also touch on some plant-based antiviral drug candidates for SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes the disease COVID-19. So a few years ago in my undergraduate classes, when we were being introduced to diseases and their spreading patterns, terms like pandemic seemed to belong to another era or just something that belonged only in textbooks. But for those of you studying diseases now, I am sure you can grasp the complete depth of these terms. Before we dive into the topic, I would like to let you know that I will touch on some concepts and terms that are new for you. I will not be going into a lot of depth into these terms due to time constraints, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have once we are done with the presentation. I will also just touch on the basics of protein structure as some of you are already familiar with it. So proteins are built from 20 standard amino acids. These amino acids link to each other through a chemical reaction called condensation, a chemical process that eliminates water molecules and leaves behind what's called amino acid residues. The bonds linking these residues are called peptide bonds and the chain formed is called a polypeptide chain. The amino acids on this chain then fold onto each other and on the chain based on their charge distribution. So what is the special characteristic of proteins that allow us to study it for drug interactions? Like all biomolecules, proteins too have a specific set of functions associated with their structure. It is their structure that is the charge distribution on atoms that allow them to interact with other molecules, which are proteins, ligands, etc., and participate in cell signaling or other cellular processes, like activating replication of genetic information. Using the active binding sites of these proteins, researchers are able to find compounds that would chemically interact and form chemical bonds with these active sites and change or prevent the activity of the protein. Traditionally, once a protein of interest has its coding sequence identified, it is cloned via a proper expression vector. Then the structure is determined by using processes like NMR spectroscopy or crystals are grown for structure determination by X-ray crystallography. Since proteins are made up of various combinations of the same 20 amino acids, many unrelated proteins may also have similar three-dimensional structures, but have very little sequence similarity. Now that we have gone over the basic structure of a protein, we will now explore some docking principles and the processes of determining drug candidates. Drug designing is basically the study or understanding of protein interaction with small molecules and ligands that can become a drug candidate. Before three-dimensional elucidation, the main method followed random screening along with trial and error. The process of docking is a computational approach where we employ different software programs to elucidate the protein structure predict binding modes and energy affinities. The idea being that the energy of bonding has to be very low for it to be a strong interaction or else the bonding is unstable. I think some of you might recall this concept from organic chemistry. This process helps determine possible drug candidates. When we talk about minimizing energy of the protein binding sites, we need to keep in mind that from all the possible 3D structures of a protein, we have to choose the one with overall minimum energy distribution because it is going to be the most stable structure. The receptor site is also chosen in order to minimize energy and avoid steric clashes. In the next slide, we will take a look at some docking algorithms and visualization software, and we will 
also go over a few key points of how the process works from start to end. The entire process of drug design for a target protein follows three major steps. The first step is to obtain the sequence data file of the protein from GenBank or PDB and studying the file for details on the protein structure, like how it was developed, etc. For example, if you want to determine some new candidate drugs for the novel coronavirus, you would start with getting the sequence file from PDB or the protein database. You would then choose a target site on the protein for the drug candidate to interact with in order to prevent a major bio biological or biochemical function the protein is responsible for. Then you would select some ligand candidates that would interact with the selected receptor site or the active site of the target protein. These ligands are positioned in a way um, or they're positioned in a variety of ways in order to calculate score that determine the best conformations for the specific compound. The process is undertaken by DOC, search algorithms, and a variety of scoring programs. So now that we have seen the basics of drug designing process with an example of the novel coronavirus, this leads to the question, how would you determine the drug candidates for a protein that is new and has not been studied before? So for this, instead of being able to get a ready-made PDB file, we have to determine the protein structure. We search GenBank for similar proteins and use proteins with over 30% similarity match. Furthermore, in order to characterize a complete protein starting only with a partial DNA sequence of its corresponding gene, we search GenBank for a whole genome sequence and then translate it to the protein sequence using a bioinformatics method called BLAST-P. If it is a new protein and the structure is not available, search for similar sequences with 30% or greater identity with a known, also with a known 3D structure. Then we proceed to determine the structure of the new protein using homology modeling and then infer the structural similarity of the new protein. The discussion of this topic is beyond the scope of this lecture. We then download the file containing the 3D structure and view it using a locally installed viewing software called the Swiss PDB Viewer or the ICN3D from NIH. Now let's take a look at some of the work done in case of SARS-CoV-2 or for the novel coronavirus. Researchers are targeting the main protease of the novel coronavirus, the mPro, the protease that is primarily involved in processing viral proteins that are translated from the virus. There are some research that specifically looked at some plant-based active compounds these compounds are chrysophenic acid, berberic, I'm sorry, berberine and rhine. These compounds were found to exhibit a higher degree of interaction with the viral protease, accompanied by the lowest binding energy with favorable drug-like properties. Therefore, these natural products were estimated as potential drug candidates for the novel coronavirus main protease inhibition. In the next slide, we will take a look at the methods used by the researchers. This is a pretty self-explanatory diagram of the workflow used by the researchers for exploring plant-based candidate drugs in simplest terms, plants were selected and then screened for their antiviral properties. The target for the drug was selected for the novel coronavirus and downstream assessments using DOC search algorithms were performed. The selected drug candidates were then analyzed further. The 
This slide just lists some of the active antiviral compounds that are possible ligand contenders for the novel coronavirus. These drug contenders are found in commonly occurring plants, some even abundant in the Indian subcontinent. The text, is in, the text in this slide is taken directly from the research paper listed in the references, and I've added a link to the paper. So if you're interested in taking a look at it, you can just go through the references. These are some other drugs from the list the researchers studied shown to demonstrate antiviral activity in various other known human ailments as well. So these antiviral contenders are also found in many commonly occurring plants in India. This slide demonstrates some of the results from the studies they undertook. This figure shows the results from the docking experiments with various drug candidates that we just saw in the previous slides and the active site, the protease of the novel coronavirus. On the right is an enlarged view of some of the protein drug interactions that we discussed in the previous slide. The method they followed is similar to what we have discussed earlier. So if I have to go over the text once again, the information on the main protease was downloaded in PDB format. The protein was prepared by removing water molecules and further processed for docking analysis using dock algorithms and a protein 3D visualizer, visualizer software. So the researchers then retrieved the 3D structures for the candidate drugs from PubChem database. And they used a protein docking algorithm called Autodoc Vena for their docking analysis followed by visualizing and analyzing the results using PyMol and Discovery Studio Visualizer. This brings us to the end of the lecture on the introduction to protein docking and drug design. I have listed out all of the research material I have referred to. You could look them up as well. They're freely available online. I have also listed out some study resources that I have used in order to create some content for these slides. You could refer to them for more details and clarity if you're interested in this topic. Finally, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I have the contact information on this slide and thank you everyone for being here today. Please stay safe and follow health directives so we can all get over this soon. Thank you so much, Anunda. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for explaining the basics of drug designing, uh, the basics of protein docking, giving us some idea about the research that are going on in the field of drug designing um, of different antiviral compounds for many viral diseases including uh, COVID-19, perhaps. Uh, so I would now, uh, Anunna, are you ready for some question answers live over here so that I can uh, ask uh, Smita ma'am to put the questions to you? Uh, yes, ma'am, I can take a few questions here. And uh, if there are a lot of questions, I would rather have them sent over. Yes, you said that, right. So over to... Uh, Dr. Smita Ray for the question answers. I mean, the questions that have been put uh, up by the participants on the YouTube as well as in the Zoom platform. Over to you, Dr. Ray. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, yeah, Anunna, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I won't be taking up much of your time. Actually, uh, see, we have one question that uh, why 30% sequence match is critical for homology modeling and uh, can you describe a bit more about homology modeling and protein docking for our students? This question has been asked by Sritama ma'am. So uh, it is basically for the students. Certainly. So um, it is 
actually kind of a wide question. So I will just start with talking a little bit about why we choose 30% uh, for as minimum for homo homology modeling. So basically from various BLAST-P and various bioinformatics studies, they have seen that uh, we would rather prefer to have homologous uh, proteins or homologous structures that are up to like 99% similarity. So they kind of like tend to come down from there. So from 99 to say 85 to as low as 42, 43%. And the lowest they have gone is 30%. And below that, they see there is not really a lot of homology as in ancestral uh, matches for the proteins. That is why it is important to not have a lot of redundancy in the templates, as well as going for a minimum of at least 30%, if not higher. And uh, as for docking, so basically, uh, if I have to talk a little bit more about that, in terms of SARS-CoV-2, uh, they chose the protease because of its uh, viral activity in, in, in terms of translation and viral replication in the human cells. Uh, through some studies, they saw they actually engineered a ligand called M3, which they positioned in the protease, um, in the protease active site, and which inhibits the protease from working its way through the human cell. So when, once the researchers have a likely drug candidate, which could be, for example, a plant-based antiviral compound, say Rhein, then they would just take the uh, chem file, the pub chem file of N3 ligands and try to model the Ryan compound, compound 3D structure closely with N3 molecule. And then they will position the 3D molecular structure of Ryan or berberine or chrysopenic acid in various conformations in the active site. And through the algorithm, it determines a lot of uh, energy densities. So various different conformations will give out different energy levels. And to, they have a lot of, they employ kind of a lot of quantum mechanics. So they employ a lot of quantum mechanics and molecular mechanics to kind of determine the lowest energy possible for that conformation. So that's how they kind of like come up with a number of active compounds which might fit into the conformation of, of a lowest energy a molecule in that given space. It's, it's a three model. Uh, so and uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, the next question is almost similar that uh, how does these uh, docking experiments uh, with the antiviral drug help us to analyze about the drugs and uh, differentiate like which drug is better than another? So the way that's done is once again, they kind of come up with a number of viral um, antiviral drug candidates based on their structure, etc. And uh, then they start docking all of the molecules in various conformations in the active site of the protein. So that leads to a number of uh, proteins, uh, a number of compounds or ligands being contenders, uh, drug contenders for that particular active site. That then leads to bioassays and then it goes to clinical trials and further wet lab analysis. So they kind of like start with a bulk of molecules they have a lot of conformations that they fit in and try to minimize the energy and determine which uh, compounds might go well with that particular receptor site of the protein. And then they select those candidates as uh, contenders for bioassay and downstream analysis. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, the next question is from uh, Shupriti Paul. Uh, she is asking that uh, human body is a very complex system. So uh, does a generalized docking experiment, especially for coronavirus, how far it is effective? So the docking experiments are specific to the protein, the target protein. So of course the human body has a lot of like complexities and a lot of processes in itself. 
but you have to realize that the docking molecule and the docking pro docking uh, ligands are specific to a protein and a spe also specific to uh, what conformation the protein is folded in. So it's very specific. It's not a generalized concept at all. And it's pretty specific to what we want to target. Okay, so the experimental uh, evidences will work very well once within the human system as well. Uh, now the next uh, question is a more generalized question like uh, food with a high protein content uh, does it help in any way fighting the virus and also in basic immunity? So these questions have been asked by uh, Dr. Konna Shengupta and uh, Srijita Pal. So they are uh, trying uh, mostly to focus on the uh, immunity aspect of uh, protein consumption. Um, there have been studies that have linked uh, more protein consumption, specific protein consumption to more immunity. But I'm not sure I can answer the question as to how much or what exactly how the two are correlated. Um, okay, so that needs uh, more study, I think. And uh, the next question is from Mongol Deep Bormun, who is asking, uh, what is the main target of the compound which is extracted from the plants? So you mentioned the plant extract. So what is the main target uh, he wants to know? So the extracts, uh, say for example, chrysophenic acid or rhine, they kind of try to target the active binding site of the protease, the SARS-CoV-2 protease, which is mpro. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so I think uh, this is also like still in the trial stage and research stage. So nothing can be said so conclusively, actually. Yeah. Uh, yes. So I, yeah. So I actually, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> That is, uh, most of the country, they are paying their attention on the discovery of the vaccine. But we cannot see in our daily newspapers or media that the drug designers are also paying their attention to design the drug to combat uh, coronavirus. So after the discovery of the vaccine, then drug designer will get the formula, then they will uh, try to discover the drug. I think all of that goes side by side. And the reason why there is not a lot of focus in the mainstream media about drug designing is it, it's quite a niche uh, topic and very few people actually work on this as compared to the number of people and the number of companies that are actively involved in developing vaccines. So they kind of think, uh, so it's, it's kind of like, they kind of think like we say, prevention is better than cure. So if they kind of like target vaccines before a lot of like drug trials, and since, uh, since we have seen that drug trials are taking a lot of time and in USA specifically, there is a lot of uh, issues with FDA approval. So they cannot uh, release drugs into the market without FDA approval, but they are still doing it in spite of not having approved, uh, uh, proper approvals. So um, right now they are using some mainstream uh, drugs and a lot of um, chemical as well as natural drugs are in contention, uh, but it, it would take a lot of time for clinical research to fully uh, mature and go through into, full, uh, into their full utilization. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, Anuna. So uh, the next question is: uh, How does a reaction between antiviral drugs and active sites of the protein determine which drug is better than the rest based on the energy changes that is taking place so, with respect to Gibbs free energy? Actually, so basically, um, the software. Um, it's, it's part of the algorithm. The algorithm kind of determines what is the uh, best fit model. And so th there might be some, con some sort of um, compounds or the ligand which might bind to the protein receptor much more tightly than another compound. But we would choose the other compound over the one that binds much more tightly because, again, we don't want rigidity in the structure. So there is a lot of calculation that goes 
in the software. So a lot of studies, they just like keep uh, a lot of uh, the uh, modes or a lot of attributes set to regular, and then they uh, work their way through it. That's because there is no easy way to say which would be a better contender uh, in terms of energy as well as in terms of receptor sites. So uh, on, on the whole, with every sort of, every research group, they come up with a set or a variety of uh, molecules, which they think will be uh, pretty good contenders. And then they further them into bioassays and clinical trials. Uh, okay, and uh, the last question, I think, is a, it is a more uh, general question compared to drug discovery, but it might have a role in the protein uh, part as well. That is, uh, is the, does the virus depend upon temperature? Like uh, the infectivity or the survival of the virus is a temperature dependent? So initially when um, coronavirus was, uh, when we were still uh, pretty much new to it, there, was, there were certain studies that linked uh, the virus to temperatures, and they said that exactly. just, like, just like the flu virus, uh, it cannot survive during hot weather. Hot so that, that was one of the studies, but that has been long refuted, and it has still, uh, it's, it's summer, it's summer everywhere, in, in the Northern Hemisphere and it's still like spreading like anything. So um, I think uh, temperature might play a part in uh, reducing its virulence, but it will not become inactive or it will not die down anytime soon just with increase in temperature. That uh, we can understand from the current outbreak scenario also, uh, like worldwide is uh, an outbreak. Okay, and we have another question that why does the virus infect the upper respiratory and the gastrointestinal tracts uh, rather than other parts actually? I'm not sure about that. I probably have to read. More yeah, and that is more uh, like it me needs more research and more medical interventions, I guess. So uh, I think uh, that is all the questions we have because uh, specifically the best part was you shared your contact details with us. So I think students who are interested in this field, it is definitely a very interesting field. They will, uh, they can definitely contact you. So thanks for that uh, as well. And uh, I would now like to hand over the microphone to uh, Dr. Shimonti Ghosh. And thank you, Anunna. It was a pleasure meeting you. And uh, Dr. Ghosh, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. So thank you, Arunna, and thank you, Dr. Smita Ray, for everything that you have done for us today. <laughs> so now we have come to the end of the webinar, today's webinar. Uh, now is the Thanksgiving part. And I would just start thanking everyone from all the faculty members of the PG department of Botany Bethune College. Just a minute. Okay. I would extend our deepest gratitude to our principal madam, Dr. Krishna Ray, for encouraging us with the idea of organizing webinars, encompassing relevant uh, topics of today, and allowing us to organize this webinar in the virtual platform. Also, we thank Dr. Komal Kanti Shom, coordinator IQAC Bethun College, for keeping faith in us. The webinar won't have been possible without the intervention of Braindrops. So we are grateful to Mr. Akash Mondol from Braindrops for helping us with the technical side. We would definitely extend our heartfelt thanks to our overseas speakers for their wonderful and lucid presentations. Thank you so much for your valuable time. The effort you have given for answering all the questions will be highly appreciated. We also thank our departmental head, Dr. Ashok Kumar Dash, for his untiring effort in proper execution of this webinar. 
the list won't be complete until we thank you the participants for attending this webinar so we have come to a uh, end of the webinar i hope you will all fill up the feedback form in a proper way in which you will need your certificate and thanking you all once again i would like to say namaskar is there any deadline of the link somebody is asking akash can reply for uh, is there any deadline of the feedback link akash mondol sir did you please Uh, i think the feedback link uh, should be open uh, till uh, today 8 pm so VDH already displayed it's given in the chat box yes so it will be there till 8 pm tonight so you all the participants are requested to fill up the feedback form within 8 pm tonight for the early dispersal of the certificates at your respective emails i think they will uh, also uh, flash the feedback uh, link at the youtube site isn't it yes it has been given uh, in the youtube also and uh, participants are requested to fill it properly so that there should be should not be any problem uh, uh, while getting the certificates certificates fill it up properly with proper uh, affiliations proper spelling of your names etc so i think that brings us to the end yeah excellent way हेलो मैम हेलो हेलो मैम हेलो हेलो हेलो
তৃপ্তি দিই